Welcome in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to worship this morning. It's good to be together. If you are a guest with us this morning, a special welcome to you. And we do hope that you will stick around following the service to have a cup of coffee and some treats in the gathering place uh, with us. Uh, wow. Uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, you know, um, we, our culture uses this day as an excuse to drink green beer and pinch each other. Um, but I want to remind you that Patrick of Ireland loved Jesus. He loved him so much that he went back to the place that he had been held as a slave for six years. He went back willingly to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that, of course, changed a nation. What a life. What a passion for evangelism. Um, we should all live lives a little bit like that, okay? Um, so if you are interested in, in knowing better how to evangelize, there's a class this uh, morning uh, held uh, in the library. It's been moved, so if you were, went to it before, uh, the, the room is no longer the same. Um, but uh, what a way to, to live our lives as an expression of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we hope you'll look into that. Um, this, uh, later this morning... Following the second service, there will be a potluck brunch uh, in honor of Mike Van Winkle, our departing youth director. Mike has served this church for 12 or 13 years as a staff person, uh, whether the, the contemporary worship director or, or obviously most recently as our youth director. What a, a, a great ministry he has had here and touched so many lives. So we do hope that you'll stick around and honor Mike. Uh, and if you think of people who can fill those incredibly large shoes, um, let us know as well. We, we are starting the search and please be praying. It's, it, it is, uh, you know, I have a little bit of a bias here having served in, for 10 years in youth ministry myself, but I think it's a pretty important position in the life of the church as we uh, reach out to the next generation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So please keep us in prayer as we search for Mike's successor. Um, it's almost Easter. Can you believe that? Uh, next week is Palm Sunday. Uh, uh, next week we will be uh, receiving our one great hour of sharing uh, offering and the envelope is in your uh, bulletin. If you'd like to, to take part in that, you can kind of tear it and it, it's got instructions there. You don't need to put postage on it though. Just bring it here and drop it in the offering plate and we'll make sure it gets there. Um, also, that means uh, next week being Palm Sunday that we are entering into our, I'm going to call it Holy Week Plus. Um, this year, our, our pancake breakfast and Easter extravaganza are a week before Easter, uh, just because that weekend is really, really full. Um, and so we're going to be looking for Easter eggs next Saturday, or this coming Saturday, uh, and pancakes as well. So um, they're a lot easier to find. If you'd like to find some pancakes, come and sit with us. We love to have the whole family sitting together. It's, it's just one, a, a great opportunity to, to have fellowship. Uh, and then there's a, a little purple thing in here that says all the other events that are coming up in our Holy Week Plus. So uh, it's a great time to be God's church. Uh, let, let's, let's take a moment and um, kind of transition from getting here to being here, worshiping God. Let's, uh, let's pray. Gracious God, we do love you so dearly. You are so good to us. We ask that this morning you would pour out your spirit upon us that we might worship you, Lord, as you deserve to give you the best of us in worship. We pray it in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. this morning. I invite you to turn to it as we uh, recite it responsibly and let us rise to do so as you are able. Sing to God. Sing in praise of his name. Extol him. 
who rides on the clouds, rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. Praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior, who daily bears our burdens. Our God is a God who saves from the sovereign Lord and to save from death. You, God, are awesome in your sanctuary. The God, the God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be to God. Hymn number 336, O Worship the King, is our opening hymn. worship a holy king, a good king, worthy of our worship. We recognize, though, that we come to this king broken and in need of his forgiveness. So if you would turn with me to our prayer of confession, and let us go before God's throne of grace together. Let us pray. God of mercy, in creation you poured out your goodness, holding nothing back. In Jesus Christ, you gave us yourself, holding nothing back. In your Holy Spirit, you come to us now, holding nothing back. In your love for us, you have held nothing back, but we do. We limit our gifts to you. We begrudge you our time. We set boundaries on our commitments. We hold back our love. At times, we just don't know how to offer ourselves. And at times, we just don't want to. Lord, forgive us our half-heartedness. Forgive us for being lukewarm. Renew our passion for you. And set us free to serve you with energy and integrity. Giving our whole selves to you. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. <clears throat> Friends, hear the good news of the gospel. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for us. 
And as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.
let all God's people say, Amen. Yes. For all that God through Christ has done for us, God asks us to, to surrender all to him as well. As we approach a time of prayer together, I invite you to join me in singing hymn number 408, I Surrender All, and we'll do all verses. As we enter into a time of prayer, I remind you of the prayer needs that are listed on the center portion of our bulletin every week. These needs change. Some of them remain on, the names remain on here a long time because the needs are constant. Please take during your prayer time this week, pray for one or two people who are listed here. And as you do, I trust that God will bring someone else to mind to someone else and the needs will be covered in prayer, just as we are given the privilege to do as Christians. Let us pray. Holy God, Holy One, righteousness, righteousness, faithfulness, you are trustworthy. You are glorious, you are majestic. You are King of kings and Lord of lords. 
You are never ending. You are everywhere all the time. You are perfection. Holy God, we give you all glory, all honor, all praise. You alone are worthy of our love. You alone are worthy of our life. You alone are worthy of all that we hold dear. And so we offer it to you. We surrender all that we have to you. All the material possessions that we own, all the money that we think is ours. We surrender those whom we love to you, those relationships that are nearest and dearest to our hearts. God, we surrender our very selves the core of our being, the deepest part of who we are. Forgive us, O oh God, when we live in delusion and think that it really is ours. Forgive us when we feel and we think that we are in control. God, open our hearts, open our minds to you. Show us those little places and those larger places that we need to let go of. Perhaps it is fears of the future. Perhaps it is concerns for our well-being today. Perhaps it is a loved one that we need to let go to your care. God, perhaps it is our finances that we cling so tightly because we have worked so hard for it. God, whatever each of us needs to surrender to you, give us your power, give us your courage, your strength, your grace to open our hands, to open our hearts, and to let go. You have so much you want to give to us. You have so much you want to offer. You offer us life abundantly, a life to the full and overflowing. And so we offer it to you. We offer all that we cling to, to you. And God, as we let go, fill us with your love with your joy, with your peace, and with a passion to share that love and that joy with all whom we meet. God, we pray that we will be living witnesses for you, that we will be truly your ambassadors in this world, that we will seek to be ministers of reconciliation Reconciliation where there is, where it is needed, where there is pain, where there is grief. God, use us as your people so that others will see our good works and give glory to you, God, our Father who is in heaven. God is your people. We come to you now in prayer prayer that your son taught his disciples to pray. And so we pray it now to you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever.
Our scripture this morning comes from the prophet Malachi, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. It's found on page 1490 in your pew Bibles, if you'd like to follow along. Listen for the word of God. See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness, and the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord, as in days gone by, as in former years. So I will come near to you for judgment. I will be quick to testify against sorcerers, adulterers, and perjurers, against those who defraud laborers of their wages, who oppress the widows and the fatherless, and deprive aliens of justice. But do not fear me, says the Lord Almighty. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a man rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have room enough for it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not cast their fruit, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So do you have uh, any um, events in your life that you would like to redo if you had the chance? I think we all have. Some are, some are big. Some are kind of inco inconsequential. Uh, one of mine, a silly one, but still it's there, was my first prom date. Yeah, I think a lot of us would like to redo those. You know, I think I was about 16 when one of my friends talked me into finally embarking into the mysterious and perplexing world of formal dances. And we decided we were going to do it right. So we rented the tuxedos, we got the corsages, and we made reservations at this super fancy restaurant about an hour's drive from our home on Whidbey Island. You know, Whidbey Island, there wasn't a lot of fancy dining around, so you had to go an hour about halfway to Canada, up on this cliff, <laughs> overlooking Puget Sound, beautiful restaurant, fancy restaurant. We arrived at the restaurant just a few minutes late, um, and the place was packed. While the rest of the group huddled near the door, I went in to check us in. I gave uh, my name and the maitre d' scanned the list, and scanned the list, and double-checked the spelling of my name and scanned the list some more and said, I'm sorry, we do not have a reservation under that name. And no, we're completely full, and no, there were no cancellations. But I called, I said, I made a reservation for whatever the day was. He said, oh, oh, and he flipped a couple pages, and he said, oh, yes, there it is. We do have a reservation for you next week. <laughs> 
Yeah, there we were, an hour's drive into our big date. And the place was completely packed, and we had no reservations. I felt like an idiot. I just stood there trying to think if maybe there was a decent burger place on the way back home. You know, one where you could actually sit at a table with real knives and forks made out of metal. Yeah, we, we must have looked really pathetic in our rented tuxedos and prom dresses and corsages and looks of despair because the maitre d' said, um, just a moment, and he disappeared into the back. Uh, after a few minutes, he came back smiling, and he said, I, I think we figured something out for you. Follow me. And, and we, he led us through the completely packed restaurant to a private room that had been set up for a banquet later in the evening, and there was a table set against the window with this absolutely astounding view of the ocean and the mountains and the sunset, and I don't think there was a better table in the entire restaurant. We couldn't have asked for a table like that. And we opened our menus after sitting down. They were in French, I think. <laughs> Nothing looked familiar. I had no idea what to order because, you know, it's not socially acceptable to bring your mom on prom dates. <laughs> and then I finally spotted a word I knew. Salmon. I like salmon. Salmon tartar. Well, I like tartar sauce too. So, you know, finally I, I ordered. Now, I, I know I'm sure that you all, being a more sophisticated group than I was at 16 years old, know that tartar means raw. <laughs> I didn't. So what does a 16-year-old blue-collar guy do when presented with a piece of raw fish at a fancy restaurant? He sends it back, right? He sends it back to the kitchen. In fact, I believe I said something along the lines of, and bring it back hot. <laughs> and you know what? They did. They, they cooked my salmon tartar. You know, I, I'm afraid that I don't have the time this morning to adequately sum up for you the train wreck that that dinner became. To put it bluntly, we were idiots. <laughs> Couple of high school guys in our dates, we had, been, we had shown up without reservations, mind you. Had been given the best table in the entire restaurant. We had no right to be there and had been given a second chance, better than the first chance, and had been shown incredible kindness. And in return, we were idiots. <laughs> we complained about the food. We complained about the service. We were ill-mannered. We were ungrateful jerks. Looking back, I am amazed at that staff. They were kind, they were gracious, they were patient and professional. I'm, I'm living in the illusion that they did nothing else to my salmon tartare. <laughs> and after all of that, all of what we'd been given, we, we left this meager, pathetic little tip as we left. They were awesome to us and we stiffed them. <laughs> Not one of my better moments. If I could redo that dinner. You know, I take the time to, sell, to tell you this silly little story of shame because it so succinctly sums up the attitudes and situation that Malachi was addressing in this letter. Malachi, the last of the prophetic books, was most likely written after the exile. God's people had been returned to their homeland restored to Jerusalem. The temple had been rebuilt. They had been given a second chance. They didn't deserve the second chance. They certainly hadn't earned the second chance, but there it was. And yet, Malachi says, they were still living out the same issues that had sent them into exile in the first place. Injustice, unfaithfulness, ungratefulness. They had been given another chance, and they were now, Malachi says, acting like ungrateful jerks. God had shown his faithfulness, and they were proving themselves to be faithless in return. Their lives seemed completely unmoved by God's amazing grace. They were living selfish, self-centered, self-serving lives. And that, I think, makes today's passage all the more startling. It's a mixed passage. You notice that it goes back and forth. After Malachi has spent the first couple of chapters detailing the offenses of God's people, he details them very well. You can go back and read it for yourselves. He opens our section 
today with this amazing promise. And then moves directly from the promise into a process by which, by the grace of God, people can find healing and receive a new heart. So first the promise. God says that he's going to send a messenger to prepare the way for him. And then once the way is prepared, he himself will come. The messenger, of course, we all know was John the Baptist, who prepared the way for Jesus' ministry. And then, then, as promised, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, came. The Lord you are looking for suddenly came to his temple. And what did he do when he came to his temple? Well, we, we know the story. Next week is Palm Sunday. We know the story. This triumphant procession, shouts of Hosanna, followed by overturned tables and anger. And what was the big issue? What sets Jesus off? It was the relationship between money and worship. Instead of people coming to make a righteous offering at the temple... The temple had been turned into a place of big business. Instead of people using money to glorify God in worship, they were using worship as a way to glorify money, to glorify themselves. They had it all backwards, and it infuriated Jesus. He unleashed his wrath on the whole depraved situation. And when it was done, when he was done, he said, in effect, look, there's a new temple now. And there is a new offering now. I'm the temple. I'm the offering. I'm the focus. And you can come to me directly and offer your heart to God completely without reservations, holding nothing back. As Malachi points out, the coming of the Lord was not all fun and games. Jesus came not just to forgive. We forget that sometimes. Jesus came not just to make everything nice for us and bring us a happy ending. Jesus came to refine us, to make us better persons than we are. And at the end of the process, Malachi says, at the end of the process, when God is done, then the Lord will have people who bring their offerings in righteousness. We call the refining process that God is about, we call it discipleship. And it should lead, it should lead to a life of generosity, a generosity of spirit that both reflects God's own character and honors Him in ours. That's really what we're talking about with this treasure principle series over these, these last weeks. Yes, we're talking about money. Of course we're talking about money, but it's so much more than that. We are also talking about time. We're talking about energy. We're talking about focus. We're talking about where your heart goes. You know, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You know, people, even people in our materialistic culture, don't actually worship money. But behind money lurk those deeper issues, the deeper desires that we do hope to meet through money. People don't really worship money, but money reveals what we worship. Money shows us if we actually worship God or if we actually worship comfort or security or fame or excitement or pleasure or whatever. Money shows us what we have set our hearts on. You know, just like money showed what Malachi's people had set their hearts on, the way that they were using their resources and energy to oppress, to chase after idols, to seek their own comfortable existence while ignoring God and ignoring the, the, the needs of others crying out to them, revealed what they truly worshipped, and it wasn't God. And it's just as true for people today. That's why this remains for us our Lenten question. What have you set your heart upon? Is it Christ? Is that the content 
Uh, is that what the content of our life shows? Are, are we wholehearted and without reservations in, when it comes to God, in our relationship to God? Or do we say to God, in essence, God, you get so much of me, but no more. Do we hold back? Do we begrudge Him our time, our energy, our investment? Are we generous and open with each other and with the world? Or are we more like a certain 16-year-old in a fine dining establishment? Do we respond with lives full of gratitude, amazed at what we've been given? Or are we a people who continually send God's gifts back to the kitchen because we think we need something else? You know, generosity, all kinds of generosity is a, a, an indicator of our spiritual health. If we are less than generous with God and with others, it's most likely because we have made something besides Jesus Christ our functional Savior. And we are focused on meeting that desire. It's because we think that we need something other than Jesus, whether our money or our time or our food or our family or our career. We think that that thing is going to save us and satisfy us and give us meaning right now. And so we focus on that. And those things are not necessarily bad things. They're just not enough. They're not God. No matter how good they are, they're not God. And we will simply never be satisfied with the things of this earth as long as God is not in His rightful place at the center of our existence. If those things are not put in service of God, our money, our time, our career, our family, if those things are not put underneath and in service of God, they are just idols drawing us away from the true source of our being, God Himself. But you know what? God will have a redeemed people. That's his promise. Malachi tells us that the messenger of the covenant, who is also the covenant made flesh, will come and he has. He will save them and he has. He will redeem them and refine them and he has and he is. I'm just astounded at God's graciousness. When you read this passage, Malachi reminds the people that we have never, we have never been anything other than jerks to God in response to His goodness. Ever since the time of your forefathers, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them, he says. God has given grace upon grace upon grace, and people have made a habit of turning away, of grumbling, of judging others while giving their own desires free reign in their lives. This is who you have been, says Malachi. But God ain't done with you yet. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord. It's not too late. And we get right down to it now. How do we return? How, how does this refining process work? How are we reshaped by God? And Malachi says, well, it's by tithing. And we say, really? Really, the answer to this deep spiritual sickness that we all have is to give 10% to God's kingdom? What are you talking about? I mean, uh, really, does, does the New Testament even teach tithing? As answer to that question, I, I mean, you know, a lot of people say that's an Old Testament thing, Old Testament law back when there was a temple, and it doesn't apply to us in the New Testament. Well, Jesus says, as he's talking to the Pharisees, we, we studied this passage a couple of weeks ago. Jesus says, you tithe everything, including your herbs, yet you neglect the deeper matters of justice. You should have done the former. Yes, tithing is good without neglecting the latter. So yes, Jesus teaches us that tithing is still an expectation. But it's so much more than 10%. As Jesus teaches is in that very passage, it's so much more than just a tithe. It comes back to your heart. God wants your heart, and your heart follows your treasure. And people can give 10% of what they have without truly giving their heart. You know, God doesn't want your money per se. I know, it's just, you know, the, the, the committee on giving just had a, a seizure. But, um, but here's the thing. God doesn't want your money per se. He wants your heart. And if your heart goes where your treasure goes, therefore, God cannot have your heart unless you have also given him your money. Does that make sense? God doesn't want your time per se. 
God wants your heart. And you just can't give your heart to God if you're not also willing to give Him your time. God doesn't want your stuff. He wants you, all of you. You know, the tithe is a part of the refining process. It is meant, it was always meant to shape us. From the very beginning, it was meant to be a gift of the heart. It was never meant to be just a number, a fixed number. It was meant to be a tangible response to God's pre-existent grace. It was meant to people, uh, be people offering the first fruits, not the leftovers, the first fruits of all they had, of the blessings they had received from God, to give them back to God as an acknowledgement that it had been His gift in the first place. You see, that's a, that's a heart issue. It was a recognition, an, an admission. You might even say it was a confession of what God had done, of His sovereignty, of His goodness, of His place as God in their lives. It was, in essence, a gratitude made tangible. It takes away the power of our idols and redirects it back to the rightful place, back to God. You know, everything God has ever done and commanded has been aimed at freeing us from the prisons we constructed for ourselves. The tithe is the same thing. It is meant to free us by saying, God, this came from you. You are God. I return it humbly, thankfully, knowing that you remain God. We are a people who need to be refined. And that happens as we become generous towards God, as we live lives that are marked by thankfulness, not fear, but thankfulness, gratefulness for what God has given us. And as we hand over to Him our idols to be burned up, or maybe to be melted down, to be refined and reshaped by His hand until they and we become a beautiful gift. We are refined as we make a habit, a discipline of giving the best of ourselves, the best of our money, the best of our gifts, the best of our time, the best of our energy, the best of our hearts to God, not the leftovers but giving the best to God who has given everything to us. Bring the whole tithe in, says the Lord Almighty. Bring the whole tithe in and see what He does when you put yourselves in His hands. Bring your whole self in and offer that gift to a holy God who deserves nothing less. In gratitude for the amazing second chance you were given when he gave the whole Christ for your sake. The Spirit moves in us as we surrender to God. So church, let us each day, this Lent, this year, this life, let us each day surrender to God and say, Lord, you are Lord. Rule in us. Would you pray with me? God, may our generosity to you be more than a number. May it be an expression of a heart truly given to you. That you again might be God in our lives. For Lord, you deserve no other place. Be God, be Lord, be honored by us. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. As God has given all, so we return to God. We return by offering the first fruits of who we are, of what we have, as an act of worship. So let's do that now. It's so much more than money. It's your heart that He wants. Let's give our hearts to God.
pray. Holy God, receive these gifts. We offer them to you promptly and sincerely and use them to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not just within this church building and within these walls, but within our community and around the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. If you are using the hymn book, it's hymn number 458. Stephen Ministers will be up here in the front for prayer following the service. If you'd like to pray with somebody else about your treasure, what a great opportunity. Or about anything or anyone, it's a great opportunity to, to be with each other in prayer. You know, go from this place. Don't live half-hearted lives. Don't give yourself part way to God, but surrender fully to God that God might use you to his glory, that he might refine you to be a person that that you don't even know what that looks like right now, but it will be a glory in his hands. And now, receive God's blessing in honor of St. Patrick's Day from Patrick of Ireland. Christ be with you. Christ within you. Christ behind you and Christ before you. Christ beside you and Christ to win you. Christ to comfort and restore you. Christ beneath you and Christ above you. Christ in quiet and Christ in danger. Christ in hearts of all that love you. Christ in mouth of friend and stranger. So bind unto yourselves this day the strong name of the Trinity. By invocation of the same, the three in one, the one in three. Of whom all nature has creation, eternal Father, Spirit, Word. Praise to the Lord of our salvation. Salvation is of Christ the Lord. So go in Christ. Amen. Amen.